manipulation. Nothing personal. Word of the day. It's a Monday. Hope everyone had a good weekend. There was a Samson sit down that dropped this weekend with Adnan Verk. Pretty interesting. We didn't get to talk Oscars, but maybe we'll have him back because I think people enjoyed it. I know I did. It's Monday, December 7th. Wow. Word of the day is manipulation. Manipulation. I like manipulation as a word. I like manipulation as an act. I like manipulation as a concept. I like people who can be manipulative for good, not for evil. Manipulative for money, manipulative for power, manipulative for change, manipulative for action. Manipulative means that you get people to do what you want them to do without them realizing that they're doing that which you want them to do. Manipulation is getting something accomplished for yourself while others don't realize that your words and actions are causing themselves to do an action or say a word back that benefits you, not them. Sometimes it can benefit both. That's positive manipulation. Negative manipulation is when you do something that actually has a deleterious impact on someone else. That happens. I don't like that very well. Sometimes it's necessary. Sometimes people don't know what's good for them and you have to manipulate in order to get done what you know is the right thing to get done, even in the face of people saying that it's the wrong thing, the wrong time, the wrong way, the wrong place, the wrong word. I'm talking about God, I could be, this is a funny word of the day, right? What you're saying to yourself, what's he going to talk about? Which topic, which person, which action? Where's the manipulation today? Well, this past weekend, there was an act that I found so egregious and so awesome and so uncalled for and so necessary. How can one action be all those things? All right, it's been two minutes. You've been patient. Here we go. I'm talking about the Big 17. The conference in college football that has my Badgers, the Wolverines, the Hoosiers, the Rutgers, the Buckeyes, and a litany of other schools. We've talked about them throughout the pandemic. It's been pretty interesting, right? Do you remember they, they canceled their season? And then Jim Harbaugh and said that the coach of the uh, Wolverines said, that's not good. We got to play. And I'm, I'm not quoting directly, of course. And the rest of the teams were upset. There were lawsuits filed by the Huskers. By their, that's not their name. It's the, uh, the Nebraska Cornhuskers. Thank you, Coca. And the students, athletes, and the parents, we want a chance to play. Remember all those lawsuits? But the Big Ten, they had a vote. And they weren't going to play. It wasn't in the best interest of the student athletes. All of a sudden, there was some manipulation that went on. And there was a new vote because they put together a committee. The famous committee on how to play football in the Big 22. The committee came out with some rules, and all of a sudden, prior to Thanksgiving, the Big 10 started to play. But they had a set of COVID rules and COVID regulations about the number of student athletes who would be testing positive, the impact that would have on practices, on games, the minimum number of games required in order to qualify to play for the Big 10 championship. All of these rules were put into motion and they were put into motion at the time in a, what I would say it was a haphazard way, meant to quickly have a, the cover of a committee ruling to enable them to play, realizing unlike the Ivy League who makes decisions and doesn't require anyone to follow them because they do what they think is right. In the other conferences, the thought was when the Big Ten said no, that the other big conferences, the Power Five, would follow suit. Of course, we know, given where many of the Power Five conferences are located, 
and the political nature of COVID and the shutdown and the, and mask wearing and everything else, how politicized it all is, that those other conferences did not follow the lead of the Big Ten. So the Big Ten was sitting there at a table looking to the left and saying, hey, Mac, how you doing? Hey, Ivy boys, what's shaking? Where's the SEC? Nope. How about the ACC? No, sorry. So they realize, oh, wait, the Big 12? Oh, no, we're the Big 13. No, they were alone. So they formed a committee. They put some doctors on it. Bing, bang, boom. Bing, bang, boom, they're playing. So then the rules are made. The season happens. And all of a sudden, they've got a small problem. And here's what the problem is. Their best team, and by the way, this conference literally sucks. When Coca and I were going through the show this morning and last night, he pointed out the number of teams in the Big 69 who only have two wins or one win or three wins. And the reality is it's, it's just a conference of absolute crap. There's like 10 two-win teams in the conference. By the way, two wins is good after week two of the regular season. But we're not at week two of the regular season, so it's not good. It's sort of like the NFC least is what the big 49 has been. So they realize that they've got one good team. You know, you could say Indiana's good and people who are Hoosiers are saying, my God, why aren't we bending over backwards to help Indiana into the college football playoff? The Badgers are saying, hey, we're pretty good. Why aren't we being helped? The Wolverines are saying, no one ever helps us because we can't beat anyone good ever since Harbaugh was hired. So I guess no one's helping us. But the Buckeyes said, someone's got to help us, right? Because we're going to be in the college football playoff. We're going to be a top four team playing for the championship. And if we can't play our game, and we therefore do not have enough games in order to qualify under the sort of made up rules before the big 72 started playing, then we won't be eligible to be the big 10 champion and we won't be eligible to be in the CFB playoff. So this weekend, Muhammad came off the mountain and made a decree. And the decree was, it doesn't matter how many games a team plays. We will let Ohio State as the best record in the Big Ten. We will let them play for the Big Ten championship. Mouths were agape. <gasps> it can't be. The manipulation of the rules by the Big Four was done for the sole reason of making sure that that conference could reap the benefits of having a team in the college football playoff. They need that because of the money that comes by being one of the top four teams. That money is shared with the conference in addition to the team who goes. These conferences are bleeding money. They need the money for not just football, but for other sports in their on their campus. When sports are shut down and big sports are shut down, you know that that had a trickle down effect and sports were canceled, eliminated. So there's an opportunity here for the big 17 to save some sports and I'm all in. And the reason I said it's a manipulation is that instead of just being honest, which is all we ask for on Nothing Personal, just say it. Just admit why you want Ohio State to play in the championship game of your Big Seven Conference and why you are going to change the rules that you changed to begin with, that you made up from the start. Take the microphone. And Barry Alvarez is a friend, and that's not a flex. He's a friend. We're not like invitation friends. Is that a category, Coca? I think there needs to be categories. Acquaintances up to friends, up to good friends, up to best friends, down to 
Below acquaintance is someone who you can't claim you know. Maybe below acquaintance is someone you met. Below that is someone you saw once. I guess you could say that. I saw him in person. He's a friend. You can't say that. You can say, yeah, I saw that star, that celebrity in person. We're acquaintances. We met. I guess I could say, what do you say when you meet the president when you're getting the World Series? Uh, you win the World Series, you go to the White House, and you meet President Bush. What do you say? I, I've been lucky enough to have met him several times, so he knows my name. So I don't call him a friend because I don't get a Christmas card or a Hanukkah gelt. Just uh, an acquaintance, I guess. But what about another president who I met once? Let's say you go to a fundraiser for a president. You meet him one time. Not even acquaintance, right? You met him. You do a meet and greet, shake the hand. Anyway, so Barry Alvarez, I would say, is more than an acquaintance, less than a friend, because he doesn't come to a bar mitzvah. He was the coach at Wisconsin football, now the athletic director, and he came out, and uh, his reasoning for the rule change is questionable at best. His amount of honesty is negligible at least. Manipulation is my word of the day. <laughs> manipulation. It was a manipulation. And we're going to get to watch Ohio State now. I wonder if we're going to see Clemson too. I t uh, Coke, aren't they manipulating Clemson and Notre Dame to make sure they can play? Because Clemson has lost to Notre Dame one time and they're supposed to play again. And if Clemson beats Notre Dame, then maybe both of them can be in. But if Notre Dame wins, then Clemson will have two losses. But they ended up giving them both a bye week out of nowhere so they could rest up and not have COVID so they could play for the ACC championship game. And rumor has it that they're going to drop a little bit of um, rain or something into Notre Dame so that Clemson wins, so that Clemson and Notre Dame can be in the playoff with Alabama and OSU. Anyway, there's manipulation going on everywhere. I don't mean to single out the big 69, but I am. Okay, speaking of manipulation, speaking of manipulation, does anyone manipulate the media more than Kyrie Irving? Kyrie Irving is the player who won a championship ring on the coattails of LeBron James. Kyrie Irving is Matthew Coca's favorite basketball player, firmly on team Kyrie. I don't know who else is on Team Kyrie. I don't know who's against Team Kyrie. I didn't know there was a Team Kyrie. Maybe it's one of those fan clubs for like $6.99 a month. They send you an autographed picture and you get to be a fan of Kyrie Irving. So Irving is the one who now plays for the Brooklyn Nets. He's the one who didn't want the NBA to return. He's the one who didn't want to go to the bubble. He is the one who has been, is it effusive? Is that a word? I don't, uh, can you imagine where my brain is? In his criticism of the NBA for returning to play and not paying more attention to the social unrest and the social issues, the systemic racism. Then he's the one who, after Steve Nash got hired by the Brooklyn Nets, said, you know, Kevin Durant and I are really the coaches. I'm sure that made Steve Nash feel good. Well, as you know, the NBA is starting. We got some NBA news. Training camp started. We're not going to talk about the fact that Zion Williamson has no minutes restrictions. Yippee. We're not going to talk about the fact that James Harden is still a rocket. No. Nope. We're going to talk about the fact that Kyrie Irving made an announcement. He said that he will not be available to speak to the media today or tomorrow or the day after that or the week after that or the month after that. Kyrie Irving announced that he will not have media availabilities at all this season. He said it as though he were taking a stand, a proud stand, screw the media. Just because I'm in the media now, that's not why I'm taking the position I'm about to take, because I'm a team guy. And it's not that I'm an anti-player guy, I'm a pro-management guy, but when possible, I'd like to be pro player and pro management, no pun intended on the name of the ballpark where we won the World Series. Check it out, pro player. My point is the media and many GMs don't understand this. I had fights with Larry Beinfest, fights with Mike Hill about this. 
about the role of media, about giving them access to things that baseball people consider super secretive. I wanted to put cameras in our draft room. I wanted to, I was the one who wanted to do the franchise and convince Jeffrey and he allowed it and agreed with it. That show in 2012, the media is there to promote your brand. Period. Even when your brand is suffering through a 10 game losing streak, even when it's a complete shit show, you need media coverage. Even in this era of social media, where players themselves are their best promoters and they all have got Instagram and Twitter and Tic Tac and everything else, the media is critical. There is a group of media people who travel with the team. They're called beat reporters. They get credentialed. They can't come in the clubhouse anymore because of COVID, but in the old days, they could come in the clubhouse. They show up at the ballpark or at the arena hours early. They get to know the players, and they report back to the fans little insights, little news items, little nuggets. They count on the accessibility of the players to get that inside look in order to do their job. And what their job is, is to create content, to distribute content, and to enable fans to digest that content on an hourly, daily basis. By Kyrie Irving saying that he will not meet the media, he is violating two rules. One, as a player, in both basketball and football and baseball. You must, under the rules, make yourself available to the media. You don't have to do it every game, coaches do. You don't have to do it after every game, coaches do. But it is the rule that you cannot duck the media on a consistent daily basis. If I'm the New Jersey Nets new coach, Steve Nash, I now have my second reason why I better get Kyrie Irving under control. Because I'm going into a season where there's expectation. They can win the city of New York because the Knicks are so bad. They can take over the city with Durant, with Irving, with Steve Nash. But to do it, you've got to have players who are on the same page. And to be on the same page, you've got to believe in your coach. You've got to believe in your GM. You've got to believe in your owner. You've got to believe in your system. And you've got to invite fans into the process. Kyrie Irving, I guarantee you will end up meeting the media before the season is over. It's not even worthy of a wait to see. He is not going to boycott the media for the whole season the way he says because he will get fined and he doesn't like losing money. And he will realize because his teammates will explain to him that they don't want to have to speak to the media to cover up for the fact that he won't. It always won the day for me when I would talk to players who didn't want to speak to the media. And I would say, oh, you had a horseshit game? Okay, fine. You don't want to meet the media because you gave up 10 runs and two innings because you were out drunk last night? Fine. Your catcher's going to have to do it. Your outfielder's going to have to do it and explain why you're not willing to talk to the media and explain what happened. Hey, you hit a walk-off home run and you don't want to meet the media. So we're going to present our fans with the word of the day from the relief pitcher who got the win because you won't meet the media. It's not going to work. Thank you, Kyrie. Just meet the media. Russell Westbrook had his first practice with the Washington Wizards. He was early to practice. I wanted to set a good example. I'm not a Russell Westbrook guy. I don't think he's a winning player. He's an MVP. People think he's a Hall of Famer. He's ringless, and teams don't win with him. And I was going to do a little moment here on his legacy, and I wanted to talk about Russell Westbrook going to the Wizards and what that means for his career and his legacy, and Russell Westbrook beat me to it. And Russell Westbrook was asked about his legacy and answered a question in a way that made me change my mind about Russell Westbrook. And I want to invite you to give him a chance that I'm about to give. 
Westbrook was asked about the legacy and the fact that he has not won a ring. And I'm a huge proponent that legacy and rings are intertwined. Your on-court legacy is 100% related to the amount of winning your team does. Russell Westbrook, when asked that, said, and I quote, legacy for me is based on how many people I impact and inspire along my journey. I grew up in underserved communities. I understand what it's like. I understand the struggle. I understand what it means and what it's like to be a black African-American in society. It's important that somebody that has the power, the impact, the ability, the outreach to be able to put their foot down and make a stand, Westbrook said. To me, that is legacy. That creates legacy long-term. You win, Russ. You won me. And the reason why is that if you had rings, I believe that you would say that part of your legacy is your championship caliber. But the more important, longer lasting part of your legacy is the off the field impact that you just described. Given that you don't have the rings, you stuck to the off the court impact. But I've heard players when asked about legacy and being ringless say, I don't need a ring to have legacy to show that I was one of the greatest all time players. I've got MVPs, scoring titles, triple doubles. I've got all the things necessary to make people realize I'm one of the best NBA players of all time or the best MLB player of all time. But he didn't do that. He went a direction that actually matters. And the truth is, his legacy off the court will last way longer than his legacy on the court. What he's giving back to his community, what he's doing by taking stands during this time and this era. People will remember that. I will remember that. Thank you, Russell. Thank you for changing my mind and making it so I'm going to root for you and the Wizards, even though I have a way to see that you won't make the playoffs. So I'm going to root for you to finish in the ninth spot, but with you having an MVP type season. The third bit of NBA news is another player who was brutally honest, and it made me smile. Anthony Davis signed a five-year extension with the Lakers, and he was asked about it when he took to the practice court. And he said very simply, he completely acknowledged that he wanted the most years that the Lakers could possibly give him because of injuries. He said, I have to think about the reality. And the reality is I have a history of injuries. So I wanted to secure the most amount of years possible. Thank you, AD. That's all we ask for on Nothing Personal, right? Just be honest. And boy, was he ever. If you are the GM of the Lakers and your name is Rob Palenka, LeBron doesn't care a lick about the number of years that Anthony signs for. He'd be happy to give Anthony a 10-year deal. Doesn't matter. LeBron, I don't believe, has a deal in place to have equity in the Lakers. He is merely a W-2 employee. He's got some power, but he doesn't care about how many years AD will be good or not be good as long as AD is good while LeBron is there. And that's fine. That's not selfish. That's reality. Very few people, very few people on the court have an outlook that a GM or a president or an owner need to have about not just today, but tomorrow, the next day, the next year, et cetera. And players sign deals of length because they want the guaranteed money. And they always say, hey, I like the school system. I like the minor league system. I like the manager. I like the fact that there's a winning atmosphere. They come up with myriad reasons that are all a bunch of crap. The real reason is they're trying to protect themselves from an injury that would stop them from signing another deal. They're trying to protect themselves from lack of performance that would stop them from signing another deal at the level that they're being offered. So when you can get a guaranteed deal of 30 million a year, which is a rough number, and you can get it for five years, you take it. And then you lie about why, but AD didn't. 
Thank you, AD. All right, a little NBA news on a random Monday. When we come back, get through these commercials. I appreciate you listening to Nothing Personal, downloading, subscribing, telling your friends about it. And I also appreciate watching on YouTube, Nothing Personal with David Sampson. Subscribe to the channel. We are on YouTube. New background, new blazer, not new actually. I just haven't worn it in a bit. The rotation's back. Wilson is comfortable for the moment. We're going to review something that Brian Cranston is starring in on Showtime, which in full disclosure is a Viacom CBS owned property, as is nothing personal. Wait a minute. I don't know for sure that nothing personal is owned by CBS. Hey, if you're out there, can we leave and take our library with us? Hmm. That would be really something if we left and took the library. Unheard of. It's called Your Honor. After the break, we're going to talk about it. And then we're going to get to something that happened on a football field that defines inexcusable. It defines criminality. And it defines 2020. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Nothing Personal on a Monday, December 7th. My name is David Sampson. Thank you for being here. Thank you for making it through the Action Park gauntlet. We're going to review later this week a movie called Class Action Park. It's a documentary about Action Park, which is a place I went to in Jersey. I have not spoken to Coca about it yet, but Coca's from Jersey. He may or may not have been to Action Park. My guess is he wasn't born when I was going to Action Park. Coca, what year were you born? Wait a minute. Oh my God, Coco was not born when I was last at Action Park. So forget that. Coco was born after. He was born the year I graduated college. OMG. All right, stop the show, Coca. Stop recording. That's an outrage. Anyway, did you stop? He may have stopped, in which case I'm going to keep going because you want me to keep going. You need me to keep going. We still have 20 minutes. So we'll get to Action Park later. I have no idea why I even brought up Action Park, but you made it through the gauntlet of the commercials. You got to the other side. There's a new show on Showtime. It's a mini series. I think it'll have nine episodes. It's called Your Honor. Brian Cranston, one of my favorite actors. You may have seen him on Broadway and Network, playing the part that Peter Finch played. I'm mad as hell and I'm not going to take it. They played at ballparks. We played at our ballpark all the time. I want you to stand up. Get out of your seat. Look out the window and cry, let's go Knicks, let's go Knicks. No, you don't remember that? Mm. Anyway, Brian Cranston from Breaking Bad, one of my top five all-timers. He's got a new show, Your Honor. I watched episode one, let's talk about it. He plays a judge. His son is involved in a car accident where someone dies. The someone happens to be the son of a reputed crime family in the New Orleans area. The son doesn't necessarily do the right thing after the accident. The father is a judge who has to do the right thing, does the right thing. It's a 57 minute first episode. It starts off in a very interesting way. It becomes slightly formulaic toward the end because the question, and there's many movies about this, what would you do for your child? It's a question the father of the mob asks. It's a question the father of the driver, who's the opposite of the mob, he's a judge, asks. And we are now set for nine hours of a very interesting dichotomy. What is the difference between what a criminal boss would do for his son or a man of the law? Is there a difference? We're gonna find out. What level would someone go to to incriminate themselves and save their children? How far? It's a cast with Hope Davis, plays the mob boss mother. Michael, uh, I want to say Stuhlberg, and I want to say he was in A Serious Man. 
but I may be completely wrong. It may have been called a simple man, but I think it was a serious man. Coco was, was the guy who's in your honor in a serious man. I think he was. And you got Brian Cranston as well. So you should watch it. If you don't have Showtime anytime, get it because it helps CBS and that helps Coca. It's called Your Honor. You only missed episode one. Every Sunday, it's not dropping as a season. You actually have to watch it like an old time TV series where it's going to build up with anticipation. The Undoing did that as well, but I binged that, but I'm not going to binge Your Honor. I'm going to watch it every Sunday. Okay. Uh, we didn't have a pick for the weekend. I don't know why. We're 36 and 32. It's time for the quickly. Quickly, Coca, the nothing personal pick of the day. We're four over going for five over. For whatever reason, the Bills are only plus one over the Niners in San Francisco. The Niners, to me, are a team that is not worthy of being a home dog by only one. I think the rule is, according to the people who gamble, that when you are a home dog by one, that is a very attractive side, which is why I'm going the other way. So Bills plus one over the Niners. Monday Night Football, we're going to watch it. The Niners are playing in Arizona, by the way. Don't forget. That totally changes my pick. I will now take the Bills plus one over the Niners in Arizona because they can have contact sports in Santa Clara County. That's my pick. Okay, let's stick with football for a minute. So here's the issue. I have something happened over the weekend that caught my attention, and it was horrific, disgraceful. And here's what it was. There was a high school football game in Texas, which, as you know, is like the place for high school football. It's like a religion. There's this, uh, it, wait a minute. It's, I've never seen Friday Night Lights, the show, does Friday Night Lights take place in Texas by chance? Because it would make sense to me that it would because Texas is so synonymous with high school football. It does. Wow. I did not know that. I just surmised. I deduced. D-E-D-U-C-E-D. So in Texas, I saw a video of a Texas high school player who was not on the field. He was not playing that particular moment. He rushed onto the field and tackled a referee of the game because he either had been ejected previously or there had been a play that had gone, a call that had not gone his way, a penalty. It makes no difference. And I don't even want to tell you what the reason is because I don't want that to you to factor in what the reason was. The reality is a high school kid rushed a referee tackled him and hurt the referee. He was then charged with a crime. He was booked. He is now in jail. He's held on bail, $10,000 bond, which means he has to come up with $10,000, either his lawyer or his family. The way that works is when a judge sets bond, whether it's 10,000 or a million or no bond, it's no bond, which means you can't do anything. You will be in jail until you are either convicted or freed after trial or sentencing if you plead out without a trial. People who are flight risk, people who have the ability to leave town and never come back, generally they would be held without bond. People who commit crimes that are so heinous, they would be held without bond. Sometimes bond is used to get people to stay in prison when they can't afford the bond. There is a whole show we can do on our criminal justice system and how it uses bond money to keep people in prison who may not have committed a crime, but they set a bond at an amount that there is no chance that the accused can come up with. Literally no chance. In this case, the bond was set at $10,000 and he was charged with assault, actual assault. And it got me to thinking about on-field criminal acts and the fights I've seen. I thought about Kermit Washington, blindsiding Rudy, Tom, Rudy Tomjanovich. Google the video if you've never seen it. I thought about it when I met Rudy Tomjanovich, Flex. He's an acquaintance. No, he's not. I met him twice. 
That's a joke if you didn't listen to the beginning of the show, which I think right now 86% of you are still listening. It goes up to 95 in three minutes. So hang in there. Three more minutes and we're up to 95. Can you imagine that CBS is capturing all of this? Who's listening? When, where, how, and for how long? Anyway, Rudy Tomjanovich's face got completely mashed by Kermit Washington. I thought about my friend, Gabby Sanchez, and what he did during a bench clearing brawl. Google it. He blindsided a player when he was playing for the Marlins. Literally, he, uh, what's it called, Coco, when you stick your clothesline? He clotheslined somebody. I thought about Miguel Olivo charging third base. I thought about what Mike Fires did to Giancarlo Stanton, hitting him in the face with a fastball. I thought about all the criminal acts I've seen. And I wondered why there are not more charges brought. I thought about the hockey fights, the way hockey players use their sticks as weapons. I thought about people who charge the mound with bats, broken bats or full bats. My belief has always been, even if you are a friend, when you engage in an act, not through the normal course of an agreed upon action, you are committing a crime. What do I mean by an agreed upon action? When you sign up to be an MMA fighter or you are a boxer and you get in the ring, you're gonna get hit in the head and you have a contract which says that the referee will make sure that he stops or she stops the bout before you die, but you may die. MMA, they're gonna keep going till you bleed, till you pass out. If you watch Kingdom, you can see how fights end but you go in eyes wide open, but there's still a referee that will try to make sure you don't die, but you may die. When you're a baseball player, you recognize the risks, you get hit by a pitch by accident, but someone swinging a bat at you, that's not in the contract. That's not part of what you sign up for. And there's no umpire who can stop that. When you play hockey, when you check someone and their skates fly up and they cut your nose off or you lose teeth, it happens. Sew yourself up, come back. But you don't sign up for someone using their stick to slash you in your face. We've seen that and that's a crime. Assaulting a referee at any time should be a crime. Bumping a referee is a simple assault. Tackling a referee is a felony assault. Charging the man with a bat is assault. Hitting him, battery. Why is it that more criminal charges aren't filed? I'm just curious whether or not you would agree with me that what's happening to the Texas high school football player It's not enough. Coke is upset with me because he's upset that the entire football team that this kid played on was thrown out of the playoffs because of the act of this kid. And I said to him, that is 100% the right decision. And the reason why is you've got to explain to the teammates of this felon that the actions of your teammates impact you. Just like in the time of COVID, the actions of all of us impact everybody else. Remember in the time of AIDS, when you gave, when you had unprotected sex with someone in the time of AIDS and you were HIV positive and didn't tell them, you could be charged with the crime <clears throat> of assault with a deadly weapon. You can figure out what the deadly weapon was. When you do something that puts someone else in peril when they were not expecting it or signed up for it or signed away their rights, you are putting into jeopardy yourself and your team. When Coca says to me, why don't you argue the fact that if someone gets caught doing steroids, Robinson Cano did steroids, why don't the Mets get eliminated from playoff contention? 
And I explained to him that if you are equating steroids and criminal behavior, and I don't mean, let me be clear about the difference between white collar and blue collar crime. And this is gonna be controversial to some people. Ponzi schemers deserve to go to jail forever. They do. Bernie Madoff stole billions of dollars. Go, you go to jail. Scott Rothstein in Florida, you rot in jail as far as I'm concerned when you take money. When you do insider trading, any sort of financial crime where you take money from someone else and you give it to yourself, you have committed fraud, you go to jail. And anyone who helped you perpetuate that fraud should go to jail. But that is a far different crime than when you physically abuse, beat, kill, assault, attempt to assault, kill, batter. It is totally different to me. Ruining somebody's wallet versus ruining their life physically. The reason why the criminal justice system views assault as a serious felony, there's a concept in law called the eggshell skull theory. You find your victim as they are. If you hit someone in the head and they, their skull is made out of eggshells and you crush their skull and they die, you shouldn't have hit them in the head. When you're in the boxing ring, you can't get a license to box if you've got an eggshell skull. But when you're on the field refereeing and you have an eggshell skull, you can be a referee. If you get assaulted and your skull falls apart into fragments, you will be charged with a crime befitting the result of that assault. But that is not a steroid infraction, Coca. When Robinson Cano takes steroids, you don't blame his teammates. Now, if his teammates distribute it to him, you blame that teammate and you charge that teammate, suspend that teammate. The difference when a high school player rushes the field, he goes to jail. You're not sending the teammates to jail. You are setting an example in a teachable moment by saying we are disqualifying your team because you will not be allowed to be on a team where that sort of thing is even possible. You need to take responsibility for a teammate who perpetuates an assault like that on a referee. You need to remember this for the rest of your natural born life that you lost out on the opportunity to be in a playoff because you had a teammate not who did performance enhancing drugs. You had a teammate who committed a felony against another living soul. How do you not see the difference between those two things? It is beyond comprehension to me. Now, the parents of this Texas high school team are losing their mind, by the way, upset that they can't participate in the playoffs. I'm sure the parent of the son who charged the field, by the way, I'm not giving the name of the team. I'm not giving the name of the kid. I'm not giving one minute of publicity, positive or negative, to that team, to that kid. I'm trying to make a point to you out there listening, please. What is it about a sport? What is it about what we are teaching our kids about the importance of sports that makes it okay to believe that assaulting a referee is reasonable? I don't believe in a trophy for every kid. I don't believe in participation trophies. You've heard me talk about that on Nothing Personal. I don't. But if we don't use team sports to explain to kids what it is to be part of a team and explain to kids what it is to understand the difference between right and wrong, then what the hell are we doing? We think these kids are gonna be pros, forget it. We think these kids are gonna be college players, barely. If we're not teaching them how to be human beings functioning in society and understanding right versus wrong, then they don't deserve to play sports and we don't deserve to watch it, whether it's Friday night or any night. 
And don't tell me how important Friday night lights are in Texas. I could give a rat's ass. These kids are going to grow up. And if we don't change the cycle of what's acceptable and what's not, then we are just like everybody else. And when it comes to high school sports, I don't want to believe it's just business. Please, one time, let it be personal.